It's member-supported Hawaii Public Radio and all things considered. I'm Dave Lawrence. And uh, an exciting time at the Blue Note right now. They've got some uh, music vets who have come together around the music of Miles Davis. And the three guys that we're going to be talking with today are all veterans of playing with Miles Davis. It's the Miles Electric Band. They are through Saturday night at the Blue Note. And uh, it's uh, Vince Wilburn Jr., who is on my left, uh, drums, nephew of Miles. Uh, we've got Blackbird McKnight, legendary guitar player from Funkadelic. He was a musical director of the group as well. He's right here on my right. And Daryl Jones, who you might remember from the Rolling Stones. He's part of uh, this entourage that we've got at the Blue Note. Thank you guys all for, for being willing to, to uh, spend just a few minutes with us here. Uh, in the in the midst of your run vince uh if you can you, you were already at at the radio station got vince a nice hbr t-shirt hopefully he'll wear it proudly this is not the occasion to be dr down dressed like that though but explain the vision with this band uh which focuses on a pretty psychedelic and rhythmic period of miles career the, the vision is just calling uh, my friends and, and 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 cats who play with miles you know uncle miles and and the passion and love we've we have not we've had but that, that we have for for him and what we've learned you know and we apply it and 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 this is our interpretation of all this great music that he that he's recorded you know everybody's grown from playing with him and and, and playing with other you know musicians and artists and we've come back to create this music who else fills out the band besides you cats let's see on tabla di bashis chataroy um, Greg Spiro on keyboards, Minyango Jackson on percussion, Antoine Roney on sax, bass clarinet, and, and uh, who else? Uh, uh, um, we have we have Robert Irving the Third, who's he was musical director with Miles on keyboards, and uh, Keon Harold on trumpet, you know, from St. Louis an incredible way to get to, to experience Miles's music and hopefully we'll get some recollections of the man himself for, from you cats prior to, to uh, getting into the P-Funk scene way back in your origins Blackbird some really heavy um, jazz cats Herbie Hancock Charles Lloyd Sonny Rollins explain how your career got to cross paths with these cats before people got to know you in the, the P-Funk mob that would have been mostly Benny Maupin. I met Benny Maupin in Kansas City in a taxi. Uh, we shared a taxi ride and we started talking about music and I found out that that was Benny Maupin. And uh, by the time we exited the cab, he got out the cab and said, we're gonna play together one day. And that came to pass. What led to, uh, to George Clinton? I had friends in Los, in LA who loved P-Funk as well. I used to jam with a couple of them. I didn't know that they were in the P-Funk office, but one day we went to this one jam and the guy played bass. And I found out that he was the president of Thang Incorporated, which was the Parliament Funkadelic Mid Thang. It started with a band called The Brides of Dr. Frankenstein. And uh, it went from there. Guy's a pretty good bass player too. <laughs> and when Archie Ivy, say again. Archie Ivy is his name, by the way. Yeah, got to give him credit. Thank you, there, Daryl. And, and Daryl, uh, not only do you have an incredible legacy as an adult, but you started playing at a very young age. If you can explain how your father so dearly factors into that. Well, um, there was just always great music playing in the house. My dad was a was a jazz drummer, never professionally, but. Uh, um, he was always practicing, you know, at home and uh, playing early miles, a lot of Count Basie, Oscar Peterson. And my mom was, uh, you know, really dug, uh, well, my mom dug everything. She, Dinah Washington was her favorite. But she also dug, like, soul music. So there was lots of James Brown. Actually, there was a period there between, like, you know, maybe six and six and six and 12 where if James Brown came and played, in town to a place where she could take my brother, she took us. <laughs> so I saw him a lot. And, uh, you know, the, it was also a time where, you know, there was a lot of uh, Sly Sly and the Family Stone and uh, Curtis Mayfield. So there was always a lot of music in the house. And uh, I started, I asked my, dumb, my dad to teach me to play drums. And 
Uh, I started there and I wasn't really serious about it, but then uh, a few years later, heard a neighbor play, Angus Thomas play in a band. Uh, heard Angus play in this talent show. And uh, it, I remember as soon as, I remember seeing that and being really, really inspired by it. And I, I decided that day that I was gonna be a musician. I, I, I was as sure of that as I've been of anything in my life. And I was nine years old, so I got an early start. That is a very early start. Now, a great thing that connects you uh, with Miles is also how you got into that gig. And I understand it has a lot to do with this gentleman right over here. Absolutely, yeah, Vince was in uh, Japan with Miles. And uh, when Miles got back, he was looking for a new bass player and Vince uh, recommended me and they called me on the phone and I was talking to Miles and next day I was auditioning for Miles and about a week, day, a week eight days later, I was on the bandstand with him. Was that, that had to be a pretty, I mean, when you feel like, wow, I'm on the phone with Miles Davis. Yeah, it was definitely uh, <laughs> one of those. You know, we had been playing around Chicago and uh, dreaming of playing with Miles, you know, with long conversations before he dropped me off, you know, at, at my parents' house. I might have been too young to try. You know, but, um, but we used to sit around and just think, you know, talk about how great it would be to be able to, you know, to have the chance to play with Miles. And it's one of those things that, uh, that came to be. That's a remarkable way to be able to, to continue to have the music be alive today. Vince, share a story of getting to know Miles, a uh, family member, prior to joining the band and how you initially got your chance to be, become part of the group. Well, I mean, he, he, he was larger. He was, as a kid, he was always larger than life, like a superhero. So, um, you know, um, I just watched all the drummers that played before me, studied them, you know. And I, I have a lot of respect and love for Al, Tony, Jack. Those are guys that I, I just, I watched like a hawk, you know, and uh, the, f without going into it, the gig became available. And, uh, um, you know, it was, a, it was a song, a track we were recording, uh, Human Nature, mm. on, on You're Under Arrest. Then after that, the tour, to, to support the record. And that was it. You know, the, th the funny thing about, it's not funny, but the, the ironic thing about Miles, either you're ready or you're not, you know, when he asks, when he calls you. And you could, you know, one of the guys was working at a, at a music store and he, 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 he um, Uncle Miles asked him if he had a passport. And the next thing you know, he was in the band. I mean, it's, it's, he, he, he heard in his head what he wanted. So when he asked, you had to be ready. We gonna say no, you know. So that's what happened. Yeah, we just had Bunny Rietveld on, who's in Santana, and he was sharing stories too about that. Uh, just uh, like you said, it's kind of like when that call comes, you're almost uh, too much to keep standing. Yeah, you just take you take it. You got to be ready, you know. We call it Miles Davis University. We just saw Benny in, in um, Byron Bay with Santana. Right. Yeah, that's what we were saying when, when you came by the studio the other day. Blackbird, uh, we're sharing stories, as you may have figured out, of how people first cross paths with Miles. Yourself? Uh, mine came by way of tape. I believe it was through Dennis Chambers. Dennis told me that he was sitting at a table talking with Miles, and he was playing maybe a performance that we were doing. And Miles asked who the guitar player was. And this is funny. I would always come home and ask my friend at the time, um, did Miles call me today? <laughs> and that's not a joke. That's okay, okay. I used to do that. I, really? That's how deep I wanted to play with. Uh, I wow. really wanted to well, play so with. You it. Actually, I did. Yeah, the yeah. power of attraction or whatever you was. Yeah. Yeah. Law of attraction. Well, Law of see, attraction. I, yeah. Control, but I used to. Bird used to come to to, to Chicago with the Headhunters. And I used to see him backstage. Hey, man, can I get some passes, man? You know, so we knew each other. Right, the roads are really close, yeah, is what yeah, you're saying. Yeah. yeah. So um, one day I came home, and I got a call from this gentleman. I believe his name was Jim Rose. He said, Miles wants to talk to you. <laughs> he said, no, Miles Davis would like to talk to you. You know, he's going to call you and blah, blah, blah. A second. Said, okay. And I heard that raspy voice. I was like, no, this ain't no joke. This is, <laughs> this is mild. So he told me, to, he asked me to send him a tape. And so I sent him a tape. 
And when he got the tape, he called me back and he said, um, okay, you got the gig if you sound anything like that tape. And uh, sure enough. And that's all without even meeting him. That's all just the interaction prior to even getting into his physical presence. Right, yeah. You still remember when you first met him? Yeah, Chris, um, Christmas Day. Christmas Day, 1986. Hell of a Christmas present. Yeah, dinner. He invited us to dinner. Played that weekend at, uh, right. at, uh, with Al Jarreau. Universal Amphitheater. Yeah, that's right. He invited a bunch of us to dinner, the band over for dinner. Yeah. And uh, that was like, wow. He had dinner. He went up in stairs and started practicing. I was like, okay, then. <laughs> What an incredible uh, lesson, I guess, in and of itself. Is there an enduring lesson when you think about, uh, you know, looking back, you think, wow, these are some of the things I picked up. Everything was a lesson. Everything was a lesson. Being in his presence was a, was a, was a, a, a blessing because I, like Vince, admired him when I was coming up. My dad had all of Miles' stuff, so when I was in the cradle, I was listening to Miles, and I remembered all of that music. And by the time it came to the 70s, I would really got, you know, with the electric stuff and all of that, I really got into that and absorbed that, so. The real psychedelic period of like uh, yeah, early. Even before that, I was listening to Miles Ahead, Sketches of Spain, you know, Kind of Blue, all, all of those. But Egharta, Pangea, those albums. Yes. All of them. Mind boggling uh, grooves when you think back. Daryl, can you offer a distinctive Miles story um, from, from your time with him, something that, uh, Maybe you hold near or dear, it's an endearing story, maybe one that you think people uh, may, maybe haven't heard or that shows a side of him that, that you like to remember. Well, I mean, the day that I met him, for instance, uh, um, before I, uh, we were going up on the elevator and, uh, and he said, uh, he said, listen, if this doesn't work out, it doesn't mean you can't play. It just means I'm looking for something else. And when you think about the magnitude of, you know, auditioning for Miles for a young musician, for him to be taking care of me before I played a note is, I think, a part of his personality and part of his being, you know, his, his humanness that people should know about. That's a beautiful thing, and man, what a thing to be hurt to to be told. Uh, you know, if it doesn't work out with us. Doesn't mean you can't play. It just you're not exactly what I'm looking for. That's that's powerful. It's part of us, you know. It's 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 just as part of it's it's as part of it's as much of me as it is Bird as it is Daryl. You know, all we do is we feel it, we talk about it, we we joke about it, we miss him, and we go on stage and we just play. We call it Miles Davis University. It's an experience. It's, it's, it's somebody who's, who was serious about music and who taught us to be serious about music. I mean, we were serious about music before we got him, before we got with him. I was serious about music when I saw him as a, as a five-year-old. What I can remember as a four or five-year-old. I said, that's what I want to do. You know, so when you have that, and you said in, in, in impressions as a kid, when you have those impressions and it's ingrained in you, you know, and these guys, their parents are serious. You know, that's another thing. You know, we all come from serious parents who encouraged us to play music. So when we got with Miles, and I, including me, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was destiny. And was he very encouraging too, in the same way that you just heard uh, Daryl was? Definitely, yeah, yeah try things try this he would he would critique us and have us come to the suite after each concert he recorded every concert Barry try this tomorrow night Daryl do this tomorrow you know Vince like halftime you know but but always listening always trying always pushing the music you know never resting on laurels never saying oh I got to you know I'm, I'm chill I'm got a big check and two houses in Malibu and New York and cars. It was always about the music, sacrifice and, and keep the music, you know, in the forefront, evolving, never looking back. You know, and that's what we're doing, you know, it's in our DNA. Yeah, well, and uh, when you talk about your parents, that's a huge encouragement. And it's a big factor, I think, in a lot of people being able to have the uh, 
uh, the long-term ability to do what you're doing. It does come from that exposure, and, and you can sort of track it back. Um, before we wrap it up, just uh, when you think about Blackbird, you had a unique role. You were, I don't know how many cats were on stage with George Clinton and the P-Funk mob. I've seen them uh, probably 15, 20 times. There might have been 18, 20, I mean, how many? The exact number always changed. Right, I mean, because cats are coming and going. Counted was 27 at one time. Can you even imagine? And, and when you think of it, was, it was an orchestra? <laughs> it was an orchestra. <laughs> the orchestra of chaos. The experience of having to try to, to ride herd over that versus your role in this ensemble. Two different worlds. They're absolutely two different worlds. So when destiny calls, you go where you're sent and I was asked to come here and my destiny told me to come and do this. I love them both equally. There's no separating, there's no one, you know, no comparing or nothing like that. These are two musics that I love, three of my favorite bands of all time, Parliament Funkadelic, Miles Davis, Jimi Hendrix, you know. So I'm doing something that I love. It's destiny, it calls and I am, I'm answering, so. It's as simple as that. Was it difficult to try to bring some sort of order to the chaos of that scene? I didn't try. George did. <laughs> George, George was the, uh, how, do you, how did they say? George loves the chaos. So, fine. You love the chaos. I'll play the guitar. Whatever you, whatever you want. You know. Miles would call me in the morning. Every, when I did play with him, he called me every morning and tell me what he wanted me to do. Every morning without fail. So that's the role you play when you know when, when he asks you to do something you do what he what he was like that's called being a professional too is making fitting in the gig and what's required of that gig yeah part of the, the quest yeah yeah it is you come from a whole different gig too what's up with the stones i, I, I was looking at uh before this i was watching some videos it looked like you were there at the what had to be an amazing gig the cuba gig oh yeah that was that was special it was very special um um, you know, those guys have been at what they've been doing for a long time, and so, um, and been very, very serious about it. So, um, that was a really special night. I've actually had a few people call, and, and I have not looked at the video of it or the, uh, of the, the film, but, um, I remember being on stage that night and re realizing that something really special was happening. The significance of it all. How'd you get that gig? How did I get the gig with the film? Yeah. Um, I auditioned, actually. Um, a friend called and told me that Bill was leaving and um, got me a, you know, mixed management's phone number. I called and, and requested to get on a list if there was one. And they called, a few, you know, about, I think it was about nine months later. They called and I auditioned and... Uh, was lucky enough to uh, to get the gig. Fateful experience. I remember watching you rock out at Foxborough Stadium in Mass with Lenny Kravitz had opened up the show. It was just a uh, just brilliant at the Fleet Center there. Other shows, I think it was Johnny Lang was on the uh, opening yeah. another time. But uh, just just great the way you can hopscotch through all this different stuff and bring your talents around. Uh, I, I really admire that, Daryl. Vince, thank you for uh, for rounding these cats up, letting me take a few minutes to pick your brain. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you for uh, just the generosity of your time, sharing some stories about this very special gig, the Miles Electric Band with us, and, and uh, letting us put it on Hawaii Public Radio right during our pledge drive, too, so it couldn't have come at a better time. I'm, I'm grateful for your time. Thanks for having us, man. You're quite welcome. Thank you, Blackburn. Thank you so much for having us. I really Really appreciate this. Daryl, God bless, brother. My pleasure. Thank you. Aloha, my friends. This is Vince Wilburn Jr. from the Miles Electric Band. There's no better way to spend the afternoon than here with my friend Dave Lawrence. But right now, it's time to make a pledge to HPR. It's member-supported nonprofit radio station. And all things considered, is not free. Here's how to show your support. And thanks for becoming a member of Hawaii Public Radio. Aloha, one and all. It's Blackbird McKnight from the Miles Electric Band and, of course, a veteran of Parliament Funkadelic. You and I are right here where we should be with our friend Dave Lawrence. But as you all enjoy All Things Considered on Hawaii Public Radio, please make a pledge to support the show. Here's how, and thanks for giving us a helping hand.